Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cox. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you a little bit about Medicago. And coming from Quebec City, I can say that I was really happy to be here yesterday because of the nice weather that you have down here. So uh, we are a publicly traded company on the Toronto Stock Exchange, so please be aware that I might be uh, making some forward-looking statements. For those of you who attended the conference uh, yesterday, uh, we, we had a great presentations talking about uh, the PCAS reports, report that was uh, published uh, last August uh, regarding the response to pandemic influenza. And uh, I'm sure you're all aware that what came out very, very strongly out of this report is that saving weeks in delivering the vaccine could translate into saving tens of thousands of lives. And uh, in this report, they estimated that delivering, delivering a vaccine a month earlier could have saved more than 2,000 lives in 2009. So they really acknowledge uh, a need for an increased capacity to, response, to respond more quickly to an influenza pandemic. But not only that, if we increase this capacity, we will also be able to respond to any type of emerging threats that could be out there waiting for us, maybe. So uh, we had the chance to, talk about, to, to hear about a few of the different chapters of this report uh, yesterday, but now I want to address one of the recommendations that was made in this report regarding uh, the launch of an aggressive uh, initiative to support the development of recombinant-based influenza vaccines because they realize that this is one of the greatest potential to shorten the time and uh, uh, increase the, the capacity of recombinant, uh, of influenza vaccines. So this is uh, some of the benefits that were highlighted in the PCAS report uh, last August, and I wanted to kind of highlight uh, these, especially say, by saying that all recombinant technologies are not equal. If you think about producing larger volumes of vaccine and establishing an extensive surge capacity, uh, depending on the technology that you're using, a recombinant technology, uh, if you're using bioreactor, uh, scale up can be an issue. And also the control of surge capacity can be uh, challenging to not only to increase the capacity, but also to be able to reduce it if needed if you don't need as much vaccines that you thought at the beginning. Also, using the platform to produce other products, uh, I'm sure that those of you working in manufacturing are aware that often the process of uh, uh, manufacturing these uh, products are often product-based. Transferring the technology to other countries, the cost of these technology is an issue, so uh, this can have an impact for the transfer. And finally, platform flexibility in order to design more potent antigens. So the government recognized that this, these technologies can do that. But not only you, can, you have to produce these antigens, but you need to present these antigen, antigens in the right way, in the right conformations, so that you have a really uh, an optimal stimulation uh, of the immune system to be able to protect uh, those that are you often need it the most and that are not very uh, good at responding to these antigens and uh, the elderly are an example. So uh, there is uh, really a need for a platform that has the best combination of both the manufacturing, this, is, that's, this has been addressed in, in the, the report, but also the products. So not only the capacity, but also the efficacy of the technology. And that's where I'm coming with our technology at Medicago. So this is a brief overview of who we are. So uh, we are focusing uh, mainly on vaccines for now, but we are starting to look at biosimilars too. So our manufacturing technology uh, is plant-based. So we're using a tobacco uh, relative to express our vaccines. And the vaccines that are coming out of our platform are virus-like particles. We also have uh, developed a high throughput discovery platform that we call VLP Express uh, for uh, new uh, VLP-based uh, vaccines, sorry. 
Our headquarters are based in Quebec City, up north in Canada, and we also have, a, um, on the left, you have a picture of our clinical uh, size uh, plant, CGMP plant in uh, Quebec Technology Park. And on the bottom right, you have a, a schematic of the CGMP facilities that is being construct, uh, constructed as we speak in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Uh, for the product that we have in the pipeline, our most advanced product is a pandemic, pandemic avian flu vaccines, which is in phase two in Canada uh, right now. We also uh, will also start a phase one in the U.S. with the same vaccine in collaboration with the Infec Infectious Disease Research Institute uh, based in Seattle. Uh, we also started our seasonal influenza uh, clinical trial uh, studies in the U.S. Uh, pretty recently. And uh, we, are also, we are also broadening our platforms to demonstrate that the, our technologies can deliver products not only for flu, but for other uh, non-influenza VLPs. So uh, at Medicago, where we, we did the thing a little bit uh, the reverse of, peop uh, of the way people are usually, are usually thinking about science. Uh, we started with a product that we scaled up very rapidly to have a CGMP process in place, and then we figured out, wow, this is a good, <laughs> this is a good technology. We should try to kind of scale it down to do the screening of more, uh, you know, a broader var var variety, sorry, of uh, antigens, and uh, and be able to use what we know at large scale, do it at smaller scale, and then we can transfer that very, very rapidly into more advanced development and cl clinical science uh, lots to do, to uh, really uh, speed up the time to market and uh, develop, development of a product. So re we really uh, integrated the discovery, the development and manufacturing technologies on, all in once. So we have, uh, I mentioned the VLP Express uh, platform uh, at the beginning, but we also have a glycoengineering platform that we call a GlycoPlus to do some glycomodulation of recombinant proteins. Uh, and these two uh, platforms can screen hundreds of constructs in about 10 weeks from sequence up to uh, milligram purified quantities. And then what, as what came come out of this uh, research part can be translated, transferred really rapidly into the development scale, uh, into the uh, pilot clinical scale, sorry, uh, in our Quebec-based facility, which can handle preclinical uh, material up to phase two clinical lots. So we can make uh, two lots uh, per week at 10 to 15 kilograms of uh, biomass per lot for about, let's say, uh, 1 million doses of monovalent vaccine per year. And then once our uh, CGMP facility is up and running in uh, North Carolina, this will be our commercial facility and will be used for pandemic, seasonal flu vaccines, and other vaccines that will come out of our platform. And this will have the capacity to produce 100 million doses of monovalent vaccine per year with the potential to expand to double this size per year. So if you take a look, that, that's a, a prima, like we say in French, that's the first picture that we, that, that we show of our facility in North Carolina. Uh, we're pretty proud of this facility because this, ha this uh, construction has started last August and this will be up and running by the end of this, before the end of the year. So it's a 12 month project, uh, very rapid to build. It's gonna be four times the size of the facility that we have in Quebec. And all this for less than $35 million in investment. So more 120 million doses for less than $35 million. So it's pretty interesting, I think. So uh, a big difference uh, uh, with uh, what we have in uh, Quebec is that all the growths of plants and all the infiltration part, this is the term we use uh, uh, to, uh, when we integrate the genetic material into the plants, it's an inf infiltration step. All of this will be fully automated, so there will be no human in intervention. This facility can handle 15,000 plants per day at, and 30, uh, 300 kilograms of biomass per batch. And this is, has been uh, designed as a multi-product facility. And once it's uh, ready, we'll be also ready to do the rapid fire tests, 
that is required by a funding that we got uh, last August from DARPA, Department of Defense, uh, $20 million in funding to demonstrate the capacity to produce 10 million doses of H1 VLP in one month. So we have the facility and uh, we, we have the speed too. So to, uh, uh, to uh, respond to a pandemic, we need to be fast. So uh, before the last pandemic, we knew on paper that we were able to make a vaccine in less than a month. But when, once the first news came out of the, what was going on in Mexico, we decided to, to see if we could really make it. So as soon as we got the sequence out uh, from the CDC on April 24th, we started the clock and started manufacturing the vaccines. So we got the gene synthesized and we introduced the genetic material into the plants on May 8th, about five days for incubation and production of the vaccine into the plants. And on May 15th, we got the first lot of vaccine purified. So it, it's less than three weeks after the identification of the pandemic strain. So we were among the, I think, the, the, the quickest of, uh, of uh, manufacturer, manufacturers out there to deliver a, a, a purified vaccine lot. So this is uh, what the, our VLP-based vaccine looked like. Uh, on the right hand side, you have a schematic of an influenza viruses with the in pink, it's the lipid bilayer coming from the host uh, cell membrane when the virus buds out of the, of the, of the cells. In green are uh, HA uh, spikes, and in uh, yellow are uh, neuraminidase spikes. On the left, you have the schematic of our VLP. We're using only the maglutinin gene to make the VLP. And uh, since it's a virus-like particle, there is no genetic background in, uh, inside it, so there's no replication, it's not non-infectious. And if you take a look at an electron micrograph of uh, a virus compared to our VLPs, they really look alike a lot. So you have the advantages of presenting the antigen to the immune system in a, in a scaffold that is very similar to what the host will see when, when you get infected by uh, an influenza virus. So uh, it's good, we have the, the speed, we have the, 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 the product, uh, but how do we get this out of the plants? People that are been following maybe the plant-made industries. Uh, this, is, uh, this has always been a challenge to, uh, to, 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 to get the right technology to, to have a, uh, the best cost-effective uh, manufacturing technology for, uh, for coming out of the plant. And the biggest challenge was to find a way to have a, a cheap uh, process to get, to get rid of all the plant contaminants. And we took advantage of how the system in the plants is uh, accumulating the VLP to uh, design a new purification process and reduce significantly the complexity of the purification. So uh, this is a schematic on, on, of how the VLPs are produced in the plant. So on the left, you have the, the membrane, the plasma membrane of a plant with the different host uh, proteins uh, at the surface. And then you have the HA that is being tra uh, translated into the plant cells and that, that they, are, um, they are accumulating in a certain region of the plasma mem membrane called the lipid rafts. And as they accumulate, they, they kind of push away the host proteins to, to have a very, very uh, high density of AHA, and at one point the plasma membrane will invag invaginate and bud out of the, of the plasma membrane to form the virus-like particles. And uh, at the bottom right, you have a, an electron micrograph where you can see uh, the, the VLPs accumulating out of the plasma membrane, but you have to remember that the plasma, uh, plant cells, you have the plasma membrane, but you have the, a rigid cell wall at, uh, over on the top of it. So the VLPs are stuck in between the cell wall and the plasma membrane. So uh, we found a way to get these VLP out of the, the plant uh, cells without bringing all the contaminants with, uh, with us. So on the left, you have the more traditional way of uh, extracting 
uh, recombinant proteins produced in plants, which uh, involve uh, mechanical disruption of the plant leaves. So this means that you will have also all the plant contaminants coming out uh, with your product, which brings a, a, la a layer of complexity to purify the product. With, with our uh, new process to, uh, to, uh, to purify the VLP, we use a biochemical treatment that will depolymerize the cell wall of uh, the plant cells. So this will really highly um, concentrate and purify mainly the VLPs that are stuck in between the cell wall and the plasma membrane. So within one simple step, we'll get rid of most of the plant contaminants with very uh, simple uh, purification uh, process. And another advantage of this system is that all you have is mature, fully mature proteins that are getting out of the system and not a mix of all the, the different, you know, maturation uh, products uh, that you get with the me mechanical disruption. So this is a nice illustration of how pure the product uh, is once we uh, get it uh, out of the, of the plant cells. So we have uh, a product purity of uh, about 97%, so which is pretty, uh, pretty pure for, uh, for uh, that type of product. So we we have the product, now is it working? So this is, uh, I'm gonna talk about the phase two clinical trial that is ongoing in Canada right now. I won't go into the details of the design of the trial, which is pretty standard uh, uh, trial uh, for, for this type of vaccines. I just want to bring your attention to the top of the slide where the, 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 the trial was designed in two parts. So uh, the part A was 135 subjects, two doses, uh, 20, 30, and 45 micrograms with alum. H5 is a tricky antigen. It's very hard to get a, a, an immune response against it. So we decided to go with uh, an adjuvant, but which is a pretty uh, well-known adjuvant and well-accepted in the community. So we, we went with alum. And we also tried the 45 micrograms alone or, uh, or the placebo. And then the part B, uh, is to move and know more about the optimal dose that will have been selected in the part A of the trial uh, and have more, more results out of this. So these are the results that we have obtained. Uh, these are interim results of the part A of the phase two that is ongoing in Canada right now. Uh, the results have been stratified in age groups to be able to compare to different uh, clinical trials that are ongoing with our, or that have been uh, performed uh, previously with an H5 vaccine. So what uh, we have observed is that with the 20 microgram doses, we can meet two out of the three uh, CHMP criteria for uh, licensure of seasonal vaccines. So uh, these uh, were very, uh, very good results that uh, we, we had uh, with, this is a two doses. And the important thing is that we couldn't find any st statistically different, uh, significant difference, sorry, between all the different doses uh, that we, we have tested in our um, adjuvanted doses in our, in our uh, trial. So the key results of this part A is that was safe, so it's well, well tolerated, you know, standard uh, adverse events, mild and of short uh, duration, no onset of allergic reactions after vaccination, uh, immunogenic, immunogenic at all doses, so we haven't seen any benefits of moving with higher doses, so that's why the part B of the, of the clinical trial is ongoing with 25 micrograms. And uh, we uh, subjects were, were first dose on April 4th. So results will be out somewhere this summer. <coughs> so just uh, as a, a comparison, uh, I, want, we want, I wanted to show you some comparative data for the H5N1 uh, vaccines. Uh, at the top, you have the results that we have observed uh, with our phase two trial. And, uh, the rest of the tables are uh, other results, uh, are results from other companies and other technologies, new technologies or, uh, you know, standard traditional uh, egg-based uh, uh, technologies for making influenza vaccines. And uh, what we have observed with these results, and uh, it's at 
for the moment we are the best in class regarding the dosage and, uh, and the, 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 the results of seroconversion and seroprotection observed uh, in humans. So we also wanted to know uh, more about our product regarding the cross-reactivity of, uh, of the vac that is induced by the vaccine. So uh, we tested the antisera of, uh, of the subjects uh, immunized with our H5 vaccines, and we observed that we could see uh, seroconversion for most of the strain uh, against which uh, we tested uh, the, the the, the Sera H5, H5 strain, and, uh, but all of them, uh, if not all of them seroconverted, all of them were, had a, at least a positive response. And I'm sure that you, you, you saw the zero there that could be intriguing for some of you. So this is kind of uh, how I wanted to introduce you that with the VLP that we are producing in plants, it's a different way of presenting uh, the, the antigen to the immune system. So we are not only inducing antibodies, but we are also inducing cell-mediated immunity. And we demonstrate that, demonstrate, demonstrated that sorry, uh, in ferrets, uh, where uh, ferrets were immunized with, the, with our Indonesia H5 uh, VLP vaccines and challenged with a Vietnam a strain, which is a different clade. And uh, what we observe is that even though we were not able to uh, show uh, functional antibodies against the challenge strain, the Vietnam strain, ferrets were nevertheless 100% protected by our vaccines. So antibodies are not the only uh, means to protect against uh, this uh, H5 uh, strain. And uh, this also correlates with uh, viral clearance. So it's not only survival, the system can also get rid of the, the, the infecting viruses because we also demonstrated that those that survived the, 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 the challenge also cleared the, the viruses from the respiratory tracts, both the upper respiratory tracts and also the lungs. So the next steps uh, for us, uh, for the H5 uh, VLP vaccine, is to first complete uh, the, the phase two trial uh, by uh, this summer. And then we'll move on to discuss with, with uh, regulators and governments uh, for funding of uh, additional clinical trials uh, if needed. Will it be a phase three, if an extended phase two? That's something that we want to talk uh, to governments about. Uh, we also have the phase one that uh, is planned for this year uh, for the combination of an intradermal administration of our vaccine mixed with uh, the GLA uh, adjuvant from uh, uh, IDRI in Seattle, and this is uh, under a DARPA grant. Regarding our Sinol vaccine, uh, we have the phase one ongoing with the monovalent H1, uh, 2009 H1 uh, VLP that is to be completed also uh, this summer. And then we'll move on into a phase two way with the two other strains. So we'll do a bridge, a bridge study uh, into LT adults and then move on to other age groups. Our commercial facility uh, will be up and running also by the end of this year. And as I mentioned at the beginning, now, now that we have demonstrated that it's working uh, for influenza uh, vaccines uh, with our system, we want to push uh, this, uh, this technology and uh, move on uh, to other targets in uh, using the same scaffold, the same VLP scaffold uh, in our system. So uh, we have two new VLP-based products that we are working on right now, and they are planned to be in preclinical trials uh, by the end of this year. So just to summarize, if we take a look at uh, how Medicago manufacturing uh, technologies can bring maybe some answers to uh, challenges that are out there, at least for influenza, I think I've shown you that uh, we have a fast response time. So we like to say that we are first responder solutions because we can deliver uh, quantities of vaccine very rapidly. So at the, right at the beginning of a, of a pandemic, we can deliver uh, doses and we have a potential for a very large supply of vaccines because we're relying on plants and not on the bioformanter scale up. It's low cost, so uh, we, 
we uh, estimate that our capital costs and COGS are about 10x less than what we've seen, well, what you see with uh, egg-based. And uh, it's low maintenance costs also. Plants are pretty cheap to handle compared to chicken, eggs, farms, farmers. So uh, this is interesting in a market that is very uh, fluctuating. Uh, we have a flexible platform. Uh, we can make multiple products. I've mentioned VLPs, but we can make any type of recombinant proteins, enzyme, antibodies. Uh, scale up and scale down can be on demand. And we have, I think, a unique uh, combination of uh, innovative technologies uh, with our discovery platforms for VLPs, our glycomodulation platform, and this, all of this all, uh, that get out of the discovery lab can move very rapidly into large-scale CGMP manufacturing. And if we look at the product, uh, we have demonstrated that we can induce a strong and a broad immune response with uh, neutralizing antibodies both in both uh, clinical trials uh, results phase one and phase two. We have also cell-mediated immunity that we have demonstrated in ferrets with the enterologous challenge. And uh, this uh, combination of strong antibody response and cell-mediated immunity uh, is uh, very important to prevent infection and death, but also reduce the spread uh, of the virus and the systemic uptake. And come for a, a broad cross-protection against the different strains and also protect those that are the most in need uh, for that type of protection. And on this side, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Natalie, for a very nice talk. I think we have time for a few questions. I would like to start with a burning one. Protein Sciences company that I work for um, had their first phase one clinical study results in 1995. It's today, 2011, three years ago, we filed our biologics license application. And I cannot stop but wonder when I see you present that you've been willing and able to invest 35 million in a manufacturing facility. How are you gonna be able to sustain that business model? Because it might take as long as another 10 years before this product gets approved. Um. That's a very good question. Um, in fact, the, the commercial facility that we are building right now, uh, it will be for our flu product, but it also designed to uh, be able to handle other type of products that are not necessarily vaccines or... Wow. <laughs> no, no flowers. No, and we won't make cigarettes then either. <laughs> but um, in fact, it, let's say that uh, this facility was uh, built because it was a good timing uh, for, uh, for uh, what uh, DARPA was looking for and what we were looking for because to move into a phase three uh, study, we needed a commercial facility to be up and running. So uh, let's say that it was maybe earlier than we thought, maybe one or two uh, years earlier than we thought, but we decided to move on with this because the, the opportunity was there. And also uh, the facility, uh, uh, we are building it in collaboration with Alexandria Real Estate in North Carolina who are building the facility for us and will be leasing it uh, to us. So this, this is a kind of a risk mitigation uh, strategy. <laughs> the 45 micrograms without adjuvant, can I presume from that the adjuvant's fairly critical to the immunogenicity? And uh, do you think that this is a common issue with all the recombinant hemagglutinins, regardless of their method of manufacture? Um, I think it's kind of a trend, at least with the H5 vaccine. Uh, our colleagues from Protein Science have demonstrated that uh, you needed at least 90 microgram dose to have uh, something effective. So we saw something, but not as good as what we've seen with the 20 microgram plus alum. So uh, we're, we're happy with the 20 microgram plus alum, so we're moving on with that. I have to mention that EH1 VLP will not be, is not adjuvanted in our trial, so our seasonal vaccine will not be adjuvanted uh, with our VLP, and we expect to have good results. Thank you, nice talk. So, um, uh, I presume that glycosylation is completely different here with respect to 
mammalian cells or uh, um, eggs. Um, so, uh, when you say that in your uh, ferret experiment or cross protection, uh, that is due to uh, T cell response, can you exclude that that is not in fact due to anti stem antibody, which could be more efficiently induced? due to different glycosylation in the stem region. We were going to hear a lot in the next talk, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I cannot comment. Let, let's say that uh, with the, all the studies that we've done in different animals, we were not able to show, even in humans, we were not able to show uh, antibodies raised against the glycosylation uh, patterns of the vaccine, because you're right, they are, they are different. The opposite. That's, that, that's something that could be, uh, that, that is possible. Uh, we, let's say that we are exploring, <laughs> we are exploring these aspects. Okay, I'd like to thank you now for these very nice. <laughs>